This video looks at the use of MATLAB for simulating generalized predictive control laws. First then, let's summarize what we've done in the previous video. What we've said is if you have a model, a Karima type model or something which can be represented in this form, A of Z delta I could be of Z delta U, and you have a performance index, something like this, the sum of tracking errors squared plus control increments squared, you can form prediction matrices that take this sort of form. You can form a control law given by these parameters here. And there's your control law. And you can extend out the parameters in that control law if you like. Now, what we're going to be doing with this particular video is demonstrating some code that essentially goes through this sequence. We start from this model. We find the predictions. We find the parameters of the control law, and then we implement the control law in a simulation to see how the predictive control law behaves. We're going to demonstrate the code on MATLAB on a number of examples. We're going to include disturbance rejection and measurement noise, and I'll show you how that's done. And if you want the code for yourself so you can play around, it's available on this particular website. Some remarks then. For convenience, the code assumes that the plant always has at least a single unit delay, and so this is hardwired into the code rather than carrying it around. If you want longer delays, then obviously add the relevant number of zero coefficients to the front of the B vector. For now, we are excluding advanced information on the target because there's lots of subtle implications with this, so it's best covered in later videos. So for now, the feed forward parameter PR will be treated as a constant, which is the same as assuming all the future targets are the same. Quite a bit of the code is clearly going to be bookkeeping. Now you can look at that if you're really interested in it, but you don't need to do it. look at it in order to actually use the code. First example then, we've got a simple example here, a simple number of parameters, and what you'll notice is the main piece of code that you want is this file here, mpc underscore simulate underscore no constraints, and it's got this in the title to emphasize for now, we're not dealing with constraints. Again, that's going to come later because we don't want to mix people up by doing too many things at once. Let's first then go to these two files. You'll see we've got example one and Example 2. Now before I get to those, let's look at this MPC simulate no constraints file. And I'll just quickly run through how it works. So if you want to play around or edit, you'll notice you can. First block here is bookkeeping. Let's not worry about that. Second block, you'll see it just finds the prediction matrices. Third block just finds the control law. Next bit of code down here is just bookkeeping to make sure that the simulation doesn't crash. And then you'll see we've got a loop for doing the simulation. The first part of the loop is bookkeeping. The second part of the loop is implementing the control law. You'll see we've got PR times our future, NK times Y past, and DK times delta U past, exactly as we've done in the videos. And then we simulate the process. And that's pretty much the code. So hopefully you'll see it's fairly simple. So let's go to example one. So let's open our command window just in case we need it. So the first thing, enter a model. Second, enter your parameters. There they are. Third, define what the set point disturbance and noise will be for this particular simulation. And then finally, just put it into this MPC simulate no constraints file and run it. And there you have your results. You can see the output tracks the set point, seems to track it reasonably well. If you want the input increments, here they are in this figure. And if you want the actual values of the input, here they are. And you'll notice this input's quite aggressive. So you might be thinking, perhaps I need a higher weight on the input increments if I want to bring that down. The weight we've used here, you'll see, is just one. So you can make it higher if you'd like. What about the second example? Well, the second example, oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Second example, here it is. Um, what we've done is we've changed a few things, but I think otherwise it's the same system. So, but we'll just check, we'll enter all the data. And I think what we've changed here is the noise. So what we're interested in is how does the system behavior change when we have some measurement noise? So let's run it. 
Let's see what happens. And there you go. You'll see we've got the same tracking performance initially. The noise is not introduced till about the 15th sample. It's this green signal here. So there's the, the noise that we've introduced. It's just a random number generated by MATLAB. And you can see what happens is it has a significant impact on the input behavior. You can see the in input increments are quite aggressive now, and the actual inputs obviously quite aggressive. But the output doesn't have a huge impact on the output. So the most important thing is it really does affect the inputs quite a lot. And the nice thing about these simulations is it allows you to investigate what happens if there's a disturbance? What happens if there's some noise? You can see the structure of the code is here. You can put in the reference you want, the disturbance signal you want, the noise signal that you want, and see what happens. And what, so what I'm recommending is experiment a bit yourself. You can change the parameters, the NY, the NU, and the weighting. You can change the uh, noise. You can change the disturbance. You can mess around and do whatever you like. Next example, then, multivariable example. So this one's in example three and example four. Just open up that other window. Now, multivariable example, here it is. I'm just going to run the whole file in one go, but just show you'll see the code's the same as before. I just enter my A and B parameters, enter my weights, enter my horizons, define my reference disturbance and noise. Here, these have got to be three-dimensional because there's three outputs, obviously, and then run the file. So you see it's the same structure as the previous code. I've just got a multivariable system, so I'll just run this whole code in one go. And what you'll notice is it produces three figures, one for each loop. So first output follows its set point. Here's the first input, input increment. Figure two for the second output. You can see it follows the set point and there are the behavior. And there's the third output. Now I'm not getting into a discussion as to whether this behavior is good or not, because that's not the point. The main thing is to say, here's the code and you can play around with it. If I go to example four, this is the same system, but the difference is I've introduced a bit of noise. So if I run that one, and what you notice, what's the impact of measurement noise? Again, there's the measurement noise, this green signal down here. And you can see what's it doing. Well, the output's a bit noisy now, obviously. I think I've introduced a disturbance in this one as well. Yes, this blue signal shows I had a disturbance at roughly sample 10, hitting the system a constant disturbance, and the noise coming in uh, just after sample 20. So we're looking at disturbance response and noise response. And again, you see you've got three figures one for loop one, one for loop two, one for loop three. So you can investigate for yourself what happens if I change the disturbance signal, what if I change the noise signal, etc., etc. Now, finally, you might want to overlay your responses for different choices of the parameters, because you might want to say, well, what happens if I change NY? What happens if I change NU? What happens if I change lambda? I want them on the same plot so I can see what's happening. So what we've done is we've produced a single file just to illustrate how you might do the overlaying so you're not having to code it all up for yourself. So we'll just go and find that one. And we've got the wrong window there, but this is in video five. And again, I'll just show you the basic structure. So I've used a simple model for this one. And here, the key difference is that when I look at the horizons, you'll see I've put different possible values here. I've given five values for NY, five values for NU. Now, this code is not particularly carefully written, so it's important that you make sure that these are all the same length. Otherwise, it's just going to give you an error. In this particular one, I'm only allowing you to change NY and NU, but you could easily modify it to allow changes to WI, changes to W, and so on. So what you'll notice is we've got a loop here, which goes 1 to length NY. So however many different values you've got in NY, that's how many times it will run. And it basically collects all the data for that value of NY. And you'll see in the call statement, I've got an NU k, it's taking the kth value of NU, and then an NYK. You could, of course, add a WK, WYK, and so on, if that's what you wanted. And then the last bit, basically, is a bit of code to overlay all the plots. I won't go through that. That's relatively straightforward MATLAB. So if I run this, and you'll see here's the output, and it's overlaid all the responses for the different parameters. So you can see in red, I've got NY, NUW is 1511. 
in this purple and my NUW is 6611 and so on. So it tells you the parameters that you've chosen and it gives you the corresponding plots. So you can see very quickly what's the impact of changing this parameter or what's the impact of changing another parameter. So in summary, we've demonstrated some MATLAB code for computing a GPC control law using a transfer function model and simulating the closed loop with that code. The code works for multivariable and CISO cases and it's easy to overlay responses for different choices of horizons in order to learn about the impact through trial and error. The code is written to be simple and transparent and easy to edit, but here's the key thing, it's not written to be robust because to do that would make it much less transparent and much less easy to edit. So if you enter stupid data it will no doubt crash. <laughs>